When I started medical school, I was working so hard, just like everyone else, to look impressive. But this made for stressful days, months, and years, only to notice that no one was actually noticing me. But once I realized there were much easier ways to look naturally impressive, everything changed. Let's break those down. Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. In case you're new here, my name is Lakshman, a cardiology fellow and a board certified internal medicine physician. And here at the MD Journey, we make content to help people like you succeed on your medical journey, but doing it with less stress. Today, I'm gonna to be breaking down the principles that we shared on our newsletter, The Modern White Coat, about how to be naturally impressive. Now, the newsletter was an email series shared over seven parts, so if you're interested, I'll link that down below. But today, I'm gonna to share all of those seven in detail with some really good stories. But today we're going to break down all those principles and tricks that I learned along the way to just look naturally impressive on my medical journey, which made the entire experience a lot more enjoyable and I found myself to be at a much better place in terms of my performance and also, more importantly, my happiness. So principle number one is the idea of the only decision maker mentality. Just like it sounds, regardless of where you are on your medical journey, practice as if you are the only one making decisions for that patient or that team or whatever situation you're in. And so what happens is if you're a med student on rounds, you may be only presenting recommendations on a piece of that patient's care when there may be so much more to it. And so whether you're on rotations, at residency, and fellowship, or even as an attending like I was when I was a hospitalist, always just pretend like I am the only decision maker and force yourself to say, what decisions would I make for all of the problems that I'm dealing with for this patient? What do I want to do for their main problem? Maybe it is their high blood pressure. What do I want to do for their pain? What do I want to do for these lab abnormalities? How do I want to work it up? Do I even want to do anything? And when you have your plan, initially it's going to take some time, on rounds present, I think that maybe we should do X, Y, and Z. What happens from this is that if you have good attendings and good residents, and over time, the hope is that you do, sometimes you will find out that your recommendations were right on the money, or they were a good alternative and people are more than happy to go down with your plan. First thing that happens is when you hear that, you're like, perfect, I made a decision for this patient and the team is going forward with it. You feel like you have some sense of control, which definitely builds momentum for everything we're gonna talk about in the rest of this episode. But the second more important thing that could happen is that your recommendations or decisions could have been completely the wrong ones. It could be completely misled by what you knew in the past, but perhaps don't apply to this patient. Maybe for example, you're recommending a blood pressure medication for a patient, but then you realize that you didn't consider their kidney disease or allergies that they've had and the recommendations you gave is not going to be the best fit for them. It gives you a learning tool of saying, okay, in the past I've recommended this, but I need to make sure that I think about A, B, and C because I didn't for that other patient. If you can imagine going through this process of making decisions throughout the med school, throughout your rotations, throughout residency, and further training that you may have, you will simply have more repetitions the majority of your peers of saying, I have made this decision before, I may have made the wrong one, my attending corrected me, and we were able to take care of that patient in the past, but now I know that everything else looks similar, this is what we should do. And more often than not, your attendings and your supervisors will start to agree with you based off of your pattern recognition. They'll probably make the same decisions they will, and eventually you will just start making decisions for the patients the same way your attendings would without any direction. And the further you get into this journey, I've definitely learned this throughout my cardiology fellowship, is that because you've had that experience of making decisions, people are going to think that you are naturally smart. But what you really are is you just put the reps in of attempting to make decisions. And now when you have a new attending who is supervising you on a rotation, they just think that you are running the show because you have or practice doing so, and thus being the only decision maker, at least in context, is such an important principle. Principle number two is make sure you expect to teach it. Medical school is notorious for us to be in this mindset of going to the next quiz and test and hoping that as much of it sticks as possible, but knowing that the next test and quiz is really what matters. In reality, your patient doesn't depend on the knowledge that you have just over those four weeks until the next test. You need to ideally be able to create that strong foundation of information, or at least have information you can quickly come back to, which we'll go over later in this episode. But you need to make sure that when you're learning information, particularly on your rotations, when you're at patient's bedside, or in fellowship, or in residency, or even as your job is attending, your job should be that if I'm gonna learn something, I'm gonna spend some time to read something, watch a video on something, just take some time to actually understand something, then have the intention that you should expect to be able to teach it. One simple way to do this is if you're on a rotation in your med school or residency or fellowship like myself, is to create a personal learning objective that you can just force yourself to go into. For example, if I'm on electrophysiology, which happens to be one of my weaker topics in the field of cardiology, then I'm not going to wait for my attending to say, you need to learn these things by the end of the month. Instead, I'm going to start looking at resources and looking at their book title chapters and trying to figure out what type of things would I ideally want to master as a general cardiologist in the field of electrophysiology and creating a learning objective saying that 
this is the 40 or 50 things that I want to make sure I master by the end of these 30 days and then working on creating a schedule where I go through that. Do the same for your internal medicine residency, do the same for your surgery rotations. Every clinical experience you have simply ask during this experience what do I want to be able to make sure that I said I've mastered. Once you create that learning objective go through it with the intention of saying maybe somebody will ask me to explain this concept later to them. How can I make sure that I know it as well as possible? And the intention is not to use your learning objectives to impress your attendings every single day. In fact it's to create this little nugget that stores in the back of your mind so that when you have a patient who relies on that information or is expecting that you ideally know it, you just come out of the woodworks and help your entire team and more importantly that patient saying, actually when I read about this, this is the situation that this applies in, these are the best treatment modalities, maybe we should work it up with A, B, and C. And I can't remember about this part, but I'll look it up. Just saying those things naturally, humbly, but because it's been in your mind, because you've expected to teach it, now you've been able to use it to teach your team, your supervisors even, and more importantly, better be able to take care of the patients. You're going to naturally have more experiences where people are just gonna be like, that guy or gal is killing it because they just understand this much information. Again, that comes with repetition, but more importantly, comes with intention that if I'm going to learn something, I'm gonna sure damn make sure that it sticks as best as possible. Principle number three is happy to help. Now, unfortunately, the further you get into your medical journey, the more natural it is to try to avoid work and meet the status quo. And as untrue as I wish that was, I experienced that in the latter part of my residency, for example, where it's more natural to see my colleagues and sometimes even myself being honest of hoping that we don't get admissions on an ICU rotation. If we do get a console, perhaps we can see something about that console where it's inappropriate and try to essentially do what we call as block, where you divert that console to a more appropriate team or at least one that you thought you could block that would have been a success. And as a resident, if you were able to successfully block a console and divert it to another team, then ideally you're not busy with that patient. You can devote more time to the patients you currently have. That was the idea. But in reality, it came from this premise of I would not want to do extra work if I could avoid it. And as you get further into this journey, unfortunately, because people are used to getting the advantage of avoiding extra work at all costs, it is natural for people to be at a different level of what particularly for me sometimes is considered to be lazy. And if you can avoid certain workloads or certain requests, because that is the status quo of not doing that for your team or your service, then people won't. But on the flip side, if you want to be naturally impressive, just understand that if somebody is coming to you with a consult, for example, as a heart doctor, I may get some silly calls on an EKG that ideally any doctor should be able to read because we all went through med school, we all went to the residency. But if I get a call that I need help with this EKG, and for me, the initial thought may be that's a little oversimplistic of a console, Are you sure you can't read that EKG? On the flip side, my mind always reminds me that if somebody is calling me for help with that, that means them and that patient is depending on me to be able to give them some guidance. Maybe they have no idea what they're doing, maybe they have some idea but it's a little misdirected, or maybe they have some idea and it's absolutely correct, but they just need somebody who's a little bit more confident to say you are doing everything completely right and so sometimes for me it's much easier to just say i'm happy to help what can i do and that may be that i have to see an extra patient or write an extra console note or just talk somebody through a decision making over the phone but if that's the process again you become equated to that person who is just ready to help at all cost and sometimes it may just be directing them politely to the service who may be better able to help them while still giving some guidance of what you may do without all the workload that comes with it but remember always ask on rotation on your residency rotations, on your fellowship, and even when you're attending, how can I help? Because you create yourself this reputation of just being that go-to person as a team player, always willing to help, and more importantly, the patients all get better care. All right, the next principle is the second brain method. Now, this is a principle that I've talked about in other videos and other podcasts, I'll link those down below. But this principle comes from the book, The Second Brain from Tiago Forte, which is basically creating some kind of digital hub for everything that your brain is forced to remember. So in his context, it's for all the meetings, all the appointments, all the recipes and et cetera that you want. So it's just an easy go-to way of collecting that information. You should be able to do, ideally do the same thing in your medical journey. To go back to the earlier point, every time you learn something, the intention is to say, I should want to keep it. Now in reality, you can't remember everything you learn. And so if you have a second brain that you can just store information to, at the very least, you learn it once and you have a place you can easily come back to. Let me show you what my second brain currently looks like. So this right here is a tool that I've been using for the past year called RemNote. I definitely need to be making a video for this for you guys, but I've unfortunately just been so busy as a cardiology fellow that this will be coming in the woodworks relatively soon. It's a great tool and I, I definitely will recommend a lot of you guys use it just because it's made my life a lot easier. But simply what RemNote and any digital hub is, is that it's just a bunch of pages within pages. And so, for example, this is what I call my cardiology homepage. It's basically my mind map just to be a cardiology fellow. And every time I learn something, the hope is, is that I remember it, but because I know I won't always be the case, 
I will go ahead and store this in my second break. So as you can see, for example, if I am studying for boards, um, for something I have to take even in two years, I'm collecting all the missed questions and concepts that I have down here. If I'm learning some pearls, then I may collect those here. If I am going to, for example, create a question hub, then I may have questions particularly to the topics I'm learning, whether it's EP or Echo or whatever it may be. Um, and so anytime I learn something, my goal is to put it in my second brain. It's not the most organized as it could be. I'm sure I can make easier, simpler versions of this. But the idea is, is that I have this app on my phone. I have this principle on my laptop. And so if I'm learning something, I will put them in there with the link and then put the information. And if I have even more time, I will put the information in the form of questions. So then I can easily just quiz myself based off of what I've intended to learn and ideally increase my retention. So this is my one place to go. So if I know that I put a dose of a medication and I would just look in here, I don't have to Google it anymore because I know I've learned it once, I've collected once and I've stored it. If you imagine the process of creating a second brain and adding into the span of over months and years, you will just naturally look impressive because one, you tend to remember things that you collect and store in your own database, just like you tend to remember things more if you tend to write them down. We're doing it in a digital version in this setting. But because you can easily go back to them, you will tend to remember those things that you have to review the second time even more than somebody who just has to reread on that topic. You have looked at the, your own personal notes from way back when to remind yourself of a concept and you're like, all the light bulbs are going to start to kick again. So having a second brain is super useful to look naturally impressive without being that cocky, smart person. You just feel like you're full of information because you are, you just have a digital hub that can help you access it. Principle number five is being the go-to doctor. Now for me, if you're a med student, definitely hear this concept really well. You will be, as a med student, ideally the person that that patient sees the most during the day, because you can see them during your pre-rounds, during your rounds, and ideally one or two times in the afternoon. As a hospitalist, for example, when I was working as an interim medicine doctor, sometimes I would see patients once, maybe twice if they're really sick, but there's just so much workload to do. I know my attendings now as a fellow are about the same. And so being the go-to doctor means just being over communicative with that patient, seeing them multiple times a day if you can, when you're a student, even as a resident, and trying to relay the plan, trying to see how they're doing. Maybe you gave them extra pain meds in the morning, did it help? Maybe you checked on their blood pressure because you arranged some of their medications in the morning. Always follow up. Follow up with the patient, follow up with the family, give them updates, be available to answer any other questions. And what happens is that even though you may not be the highest in the totem pole of their medical team, you will tend to be the person that they look at and say, Dr. T, for example, what do you think about my heart? Even though my cardiology attending who has been doing this for almost three or four times as long as I have, has much more experience, they're gonna look at you because for them, you are their physician. You are their medical provider. So if you practice this principle of being the go-to provider, your attendings will be like, huh, my patients and all of our patients have great rapport with this individual. They tend to look at them as a knowledge figure, as somebody that they would like to be taken care of. And if you do this and your patients respond to you well, your attendings will naturally pick up on this and they'll start to see the rapport that you're building up with your patients and start to see you as not just a good intellectual clinician, but somebody who just has really good bedside manner, which matters significantly. Principle six is increasing your threshold of good enough. There's this classic picture in medicine that when you're a med student, you would just significantly learn more over your first year. You first get a lot and then you go on rotations and you pick it up again you're a fourth year med student and you're not that busy and you drop off again and then your intern year you just learn a crap load of information just because through repetitions and then over time it unfortunately starts to dwindle and when you're attending it's kind of plateaus off your skills don't improve even though spending time and years in the field of medicine and the reason is is that there is nothing pushing you of saying are you still learning more? Are you pushing yourself to be a better physician? Or are you just dependent on the information that you currently have? And for most providers, again, because you're busy and because you have all the other elements of your life that also are causing attention, you are going to be okay with that. But if you wanna be naturally impressive and always naturally improve and enjoy the feel of frankly, just ask yourself, what type of things can I do to increase my level of naturally average? This is what I'm doing right now that is considered to be good enough. How can I make X, Y, and Z a little bit better? Maybe I can become better at my bedside manner. Maybe I can become better at these procedures because I'll need to. Maybe I'm going to be really good at ultrasound because I'm going to be a great cardiologist that's going to use imaging to help them. All of those things. Ask yourself how you can increase that level of good enough, not dependent on somebody else's expectations, but just increasing your own expectations of yourself 
And so then when people see you in the actual mix of taking care of patients, they just realize that you are just a high performer, but that's also because you just increase your expectations over time. And principle number seven is always focus on inputs over results. Now, quick story to really paint this picture. When I was applying to medical school, I thought that whatever I did in my three years of college was more than enough to get into med school. I had publications, I was leadership positions, my MCAT score was good enough, my grades were high. I thought that everything was tied in a bow for me to get as many interviews as possible. That didn't happen. All the safety schools that I thought would be giving me an interview offer, most of them didn't. And even though I were able to get interviews at places that I wanted, there was some discouragement that maybe I didn't work hard enough. Maybe this was all imposter syndrome. Maybe I kind of faked myself out. But then what happened is I ended up getting an interview at a place that it was no means expecting. It was a lot higher on my list in terms of competitiveness and prestige, and I didn't think I was good enough to go there. It's ultimately where I went to med school and did most of my training. It's opened to so many doors of opportunity. The point of that story is that initially there was a part of me that thought all that mattered was getting a bunch of interviews. But in reality, all I had to do was focus on doing as much as I could that I can control, which is all the elements that I talked about in my pre-med application. And then you just let the results work themselves out. It may not work exactly how you want them to. You may not get all the interviews you're expecting like I did. There's a part where you may even think that you're not going to get to med school at all. But if you control the inputs, the results will work out for themselves. Again, it may not be exactly the results you're expecting, but things tend to work out. So always just focus on what's in your control. And then the opportunities that you are meant for, the opportunities that you will best be able to take advantage of, Will present themselves and doing that you start avoiding thinking about the grades and etc you just thinking about the studying and the learning and improving over time and all the other principles that we've talked about so far in this episode will just help you out make things a lot less stressful those friends are all of the principles that i wish somebody had told me on my first day of med school and every single day there forward of just saying take a deep breath if you want to look naturally impressive do these things and none of these things that i mentioned hopefully look like you're sucking up you just are focusing on being a little bit better as a person, as a clinician, as a learner, and naturally what happens is by the time that you're in my shoes, which is cardiology fellowship, which is now four years of med school, three years of residency, one year of a hospitalist year, almost 10 years into this, I still love my job as much as I did when I was applying to med school for various different reasons, I still enjoy what I'm doing. And I would say that people think I'm naturally impressive, but that's not because I'm forcing it. I'm just doing all these principles every single day, trying to become a little bit better of a clinician or provider. And I'm hoping to continue to do that. I'm hoping that you guys can use all these principles to help you on your medical journey. Now, if you enjoy all these principles and you want all of my strategies to understand really what you should be doing in terms of studying, what you should be doing when you're a first and second year med student, how you should like crush your rotations, how to do well on your board exams like step one, how to even do better in residency, check out our med school blueprint. It's everything that I've ever learned and created to help people like you on your journey all put into one place. Just check out the reviews and testimonials from our students over the past seven years and you decide for yourself if that's something that you want to undergo. If you're interested in working with myself and our coaches on specific things like how to study better and increase your grades over time, we also have a coaching program in case you're interested. You can go ahead and apply and also see all the results that we've had over the past three to four years on students who've been able to get better grades in the span of just four to eight weeks. But with that, my friends, if you enjoyed this episode, let me know in the comment section down below. Hit that like button to support the channel and tell me you want more videos like this and watch this video right here on how to get a 3.9 GPA medical school using all the study strategies that I was able to, as well as this one right here on the most popular video on this channel of how I was able to use one simple method to increase my studying time in half. Enjoy these. And as always, thank you so much for being a part of my journey. Hopefully I was a little help to you guys on yours. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace.